All right, who goes first? I do, but I'll oh. just stand here. No, nope, you need a mic. There's a, there's a mic. No, I oh, okay. have a mic also. No one wants to hear my voice that loud. Okay, so this is the Q&A. We figured we just chat it out, but also leave room for actual questions from the people that matter, uh, those in the room. So yeah, the um, Posey, I looked up the definition of principle today. It's been a while, but I want. I was like, what is a principle? Because as Jeff was saying, what we came together to put um, and, and put forward in three actual blog posts were principles. But now we have this exciting movement in the making called POSI, um, just to distinguish between principles and everything else. A principle is a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of belief or behavior or for a chain of reasoning. That chain of reasoning is that with the set of principles can be a fuller, more holistic way in which we understand how trust can be propagated, can continue by those in the community, the constituents relying on a piece of scholarly infrastructure. All right, with that, um, I thought Cameron maybe could give us a little bit of a story as to what the origins of the principles were. Yeah, and um, as the reason I'm possibly uniquely placed to do this is I actually know the exact dates <laughs> of the Brighton trip. Um, my diary doesn't go back that far. Um, so you may detect the pattern in the way we work. Um, what happens is the three of us talk uh, endlessly. Um, sometimes um, Some about an issue, an issue, an issue, an issue, yeah. And Jennifer gets bored <laughs> and forces us into a room um, to to get something done. And um, and the way this happened, we got this was serious enough that we all went to Brighton, and we spent five days in Brighton from the twenty fifth of August, 2020, 2013, No, hang on, twenty fourteen, the 29th of August. Um, and I know this because my birthday is on the 28th. So I remember there was a whole thing about a birthday cake, which I'm not going to go into. Um, and we went with the intent of writing a blog post, as Jeffrey mentioned, about something entirely different. Um, so we were concerned about how a general system of offering corrections over the scholarly record could be built and made. Um, and we spent several days on this and we wrote a white paper, which is still on Google Docs and is broadly complete. And we got to the end of this and bear in mind, 2014, this was around, the it was about two years after Orchid was founded, I think. Um, we kind of been through that process collectively and it was hard, right? Like any of you who were involved in setting up Orchid, that was really, really hard work. And we designed, we realised, a new infrastructure. And the assumption we made is, oh, God, that's another organisation. So let's make it the last one that ever has to be set up. Um, maybe we could write a set of principles that um, would provide the ground rules. And we were, in a sense, trying to bind ourselves. These were rules we were setting for ourselves about how we thought something like this should operate. Um, and again, it's still, you know, August... 2014, the date of publication of the principles is the 15th of February 2015. So we still took a long time to write the blog post. Um, and well, the hilarious thing is we were over lunch, we were going back, we found the Google Drive, which has about 16 document outlines in it, which we've never finished. And now Jennifer's found those again, I'm sure we're going to be told they need to be done. Um, but that was the that was where we we started with the idea that something we thought this was interesting we thought it was useful we had some criticisms and Google Scholar was one of the things we were worried about then as now and as before, um, but we'd really focused on the idea of trying to articulate for ourselves what really mattered. And much has happened since the principles were published, um, namely that of the. Posey as an independent thing on it in itself, um, for which Jeff shared a little bit about the 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 what catalyzed it. Thank you, COVID. Um, the but so, you know I think there's also as a result of it whether it's Posey per se, the whole term 
open scholarly infrastructure, whether associated with POSI or not, has become something of a term of art, right? And um, there's some level of social capital, I would say, that has resulted from it. Uh, maybe we could do a quick overview or run through as some of the organizations or groups that we've engaged with in talking about these principles since then. Um, I remember a CNI data repository meeting talking with a bunch of data repository and institutions about POSI in the context of research data. Others? I mean, with with me, I think one of the things that, that just happened was that um, a lot of the people that you see and a lot of the organizations that you see, sorry. Um, with me, the thing that you see is a lot of the organizations that uh, signed up and are now listed in the POSI posse. Um, came to me um, because at the time I was the only one of the authors who was still who was who had something to do with the website, um, and um, and they wanted to they wanted clarifications and they had questions and so on and so forth. And I said, as I said, most of them then appeared on that list. Some of them have disappeared, and I haven't heard from them since. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean that's it's never been that I've I haven't done a lot of going out and. I, I used to present on it, but I hadn't recently. It's mostly been people coming coming to us. Um, but the other thing I should clarify is that at the moment, none of us really have to do, you know, Posey's Posey. It's, it's moving forward. They made edits and changes to it recently um, that we didn't really have anything to do with. Um, and, um, and that's, you know, it's great to see that, you know, we don't, we don't feel like we own this space, um, but um, we don't, we're not involved in that directly. Um, there are a few people in here who are, um, uh, but um, but we're not. I mean, at the beginning, I mean, again, we had no communications plan. We had in many ways not very much of an idea of what we were doing um, or who we were targeting. Well, we did have an idea, and um, it's kind of a, a hilarious failure. I think we're allowed to tell this story at this stage. Um, it was 10 years ago. So our original concept, once we got past the concept of, because it had generated a conversation, it, it made a particular splash and that people were talking about this and talking about this as a useful way to think about the challenges of sustainability. Then as now, there's a session on this um, just after lunch. Um, these are issues. How do we think about it? How do we frame this? And so there, there was a conversation that was occurring. How do we apply it over here? Are, do you, are we allowed to think of ourselves as an infrastructure? Could this be useful? But where we landed was the idea that the obvious thing to do was to get all the funders to require any infrastructures they funded to require the principles or require a movement towards adoption of the principles. Um, again, 2015. Um, and we hijacked the fact there was a group of people um, in DC for a conference, um, most a whole bunch of funders. Um, and threw a barbecue. And and we threw a barbecue, and that was very, that was very important. Uh, a great way to attract funders. Um, and we had this pitch. You know, you know, clearly, clearly, as funders, you're concerned about the integrity of your investments. This is this is something you're you're clearly thinking about. How's this going to work? We have some ideas about how you could you could shore this up. And my God, it landed like a lead balloon. Um, it was just a real object lesson in, I don't know whether we were ahead of that conversation, possibly we shouldn't have done it in DC. Um, there was a real sense that we were basically hippie European socialists um, proposing communism. <laughs> um, but that was, yeah, that was a, that was a fascinating experience. And, and to a certain extent, that's where, where we left it. It was picked up by SCOS um, as an underpinning principle of the funding mechanism that was put in place for, for a range of projects through library interventions. I gave talks for a few years. I did one at Kazri. Um, I did a bunch in, um, well, other meetings around the place. Um, I had to go back through my CV to try and remember which ones they were. Um, but it kind of stopped around um, 2017, 2018, um, and then it, it went quiet. Yeah, but I think um, that the advent of POSI as a separate entity and might I call a movement is really them that community carrying the torch forward. And it's really exciting to see how 
those who have signed on, they have regular meetings to talk through, you know, what it's like to be in that community. Um, but I thought maybe we could share some thoughts about what do we see being on the fringe now, supporting Posey on the side. What what might you wish for Posey as it continues to grow and expand? I think, Jeff, you raised a lot of questions and risks as the soothsayer for a profit. Um, but yeah, Cameron, any anything in particular that you would like to see opportunities for how this might continue to evolve and grow? I mean, I'd echo what Jeffrey finished with um, and perhaps expand it um, because I think we've heard throughout the meeting, there's been talk of misinformation, disinformation, questions of trust, broad integrity. Um, and trust and trustworthiness is is at the core of this. And I don't think we're going to make progress on addressing those issues unless we hold ourselves to account. So Danny's slide earlier, you know, this is everyone's responsibility and no one's responsibility. And that's not just people, it's also organizations. Um, so, you know, we all have to take part in constructing the ways in which we can be critical friends. I mean, so it's, a, it's a kind of old term now in some ways, maybe we've forgotten how to be critical friends in our polarized political environment where everyone hates everything. And it does reduce to a, to a 30 second Twitter conversation. But um, as someone, a scholar um, said to me a, a few weeks ago, um, the difference between sympathy um, with the the people we all agree with. It's easy to be sympathetic with people we agree with, and it's easy to not be critical because we want to be supportive. Um, but empathy is harder, um, and it's really hard work, and building empathy while being critical is something that supposedly we're good at in the research ecosystem. But I think we should, again, to Danny's point, we need to go, go back to the institutions that underlie things like the Mertonian norms um, and think them through again. And then I have a very concrete thing. All right, quick. Good data dumps. We've got a lot of quick questions lined up. I, oh. John looks like he has to go to the bathroom so bad. But I'm, <laughs> I'm going to weigh in before you ask your question as to what my point but of I, view is. But I have to go to the bathroom really bad. All right, hold it. <laughs> so uh, in, personally, I mean, I think, I'm, again, I'm really excited to see this foment of, of organizations come up voluntarily. But what does it mean as a movement? It feels like there are these things not have an organic quality to it, but also from experience to have a vision, someone driving towards a vision, something more structured that would lay out ways in which this effort can continue to expand and grow is probably needed. And part of that entails what Daniela is talking about with the horizontal interoperability, so, excuse me, the vertical operability. We need to start having conversations with those it directly in the communities or broader stakeholders than just the the, the research, you know, vacuum or um, bouncing board. But um, that's the, um, hopefully we can invite some some of that. Yeah. You, Q, John. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I kind of had a question and a, for the three of you is building off of what Cameron said, which is, I know that some of the inspiration for Posey and uh, the reason why many people are interested in gravitate towards it is actually this idea of creating a space for a conversation that is critical of each other. You know, we were we have a hard time articulating why we like some actors and don't like other actors. And I mean, there's a nice, we want to frame things in a positive way when we talk publicly, but also behind closed doors, we're like those people are just, you know, hard to work with, or they have the wrong business model. Yeah. And there's a negative aspect to it, which not negative in the negative sense of, you know, it's negativity, but it's just not positive yeah. framing of how people are working. And I guess maybe you could talk a little bit about how much of the inspiration and what we're trying to do here is, is some of that kind of friendly criticism or fr being being um, constructive criticism and having a framework for that? Framework for criticism. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> the ac accountability is the word that we've been using all these years, right? And um, accountability is the attribute that it's most fundamentally tied to the whole principle or the hypothesis that all of this can lead to trust. And 
to the extent that accountability needs to take a more formal and concrete manifestation representation, what does that look like? I mean, these are some of the big questions that I'd like to see us as a as a group explore further, as Posey explore further. Sorry. Um, uh, Cory Doctorow has, has coined a term that has remarkable usefulness, I think, in this discussion. It's called enshittification. And uh, I wonder if, if, if Posey could somehow articulate an anti-enshittification policy for services that are, you know, that nonprofits or for-profits yeah, yeah. offer for free yeah. and then find ways to extract. So in a, in a draft that I'd written, I'd, I'd said, you know, it's what the kids today would call enshittification, right? But we were talking about enshittification before, before it was coined. Um, the the reason I took it out was because of course now you've got in in shitification, yes, to in shitify, all right, <laughs> all right, <laughs> um, and um, and the problem with the term is that like people use it now to describe anything that they just don't like about something. It's like ah, look, they changed the color of the windows. That's the in shitification of the you know, and it's so so it had a power, and there's a very specific way that Corey meant it, and it does actually describe this phenomenon, right? Which is that if a community doesn't have voice and they don't have exit, um, they're gonna have, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're at the mercy of, of whatever the organization does. Um, so that's a, that's a real problem, but we, yeah, I mean, it's a, but we did, I, I at least I avoided the term just because I think it's already overused, even though, you know, it's a useful term. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, so a uh, comment and a question. A uh, comment is um, <laughs> just looking at the fact that you all wrote this in 2015 yeah. and then Crossref um, publicly endorsed it or signed up for it in 2020. And yeah. within three or four months after that, about six organizations followed yeah. it. And so it's, I think it's an interesting, uh, I don't know, example of, of leading by example rather than leading by words. So the, the in some ways writing it actually, sorry, didn't, I yeah. could do anything, but once organizations started picking it up, then it started getting that mass. And yeah. so it's it's interesting to think that organizations working collectively seem to be what's yeah. successful here. I mean, that's, that's it's great to hear. It was like one of the uh, proudest things that ever happened you know, when they did that. Totally unexpected. I really didn't think they were going to do it for another five years, but it was great. And yeah, you're right. You know, then all of a sudden people came and did it. Cool. I think your question, sorry, you had I'll a question. Start. Oh, it, the question is just, uh, again, as I put in Slack, so some of us have already seen this, uh, oh. for the organization that I did this on behalf of, yeah. uh, which is which has our resources primarily being volunteers and not money, Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of the wording doesn't quite work because it kind of assumes that money is the most important thing for the organization, right? Yeah, they yeah. have to yeah. do things to have enough money to keep going over. So anyhow, so it's just a, a question about, did, does this actually resonate with anybody else? And and is this something that we should think about changing at some point? So, yeah. So my answer would be like, I, I feel like it does address that. It's like the answer is you do have enough money because you've got volunteers. I mean, that's the kind of thing that you that is the principle, right? You can explain, this is this is how we interpret this. Um, and, you know, and we run this off a of volunteer, uh, you know, uh, effort. And, um, and this is why we think that we meet this criteria. Um, you know, there are other things like that. Like, for example, people say you don't mention equity, um, equitable access. Um, but in a, in a way we do, right? We say anybody who's a stakeholder should be able to join and participate in this and should have a, a say in the governance. And by definition, that means that if you have people who can't afford, you're not fulfilling that 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 section of it, right? So, um, you know, again, I think it gets back to that the principal thing. Um, I, I I, it, it resonated a lot with me because I think I, I recall a conversation we did have in Brighton about succession planning, which is kind of kind of what. So Dan was referring to the idea of you know, if you've got to trust that an organisation is continuing to operate and it's volunteer led, then you need to understand that it's got uh, a strength in depth. Um, support that those volunteers will continue because we as people in, inevitably leave burnout um, as we often see you know again when we organizations that have a lot of burnout that's a bad sign uh, of for sustainability so I, I'm actually quite sympathetic to the idea that that kind of principle certainly fits into the the concept um, we probably thought that it was covered by transparent operations but I think there's a lot of things we did um, I mean yes we wrote this blog post and we recrafted it over another six months 
but we never expected it to be adopted in the form we wrote it. We assumed there was going to be a pile on and everyone was going to tell us how we were wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I think, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of conversation about how to create the trust that an organisation is being properly managed in the interest of its stakeholders, the trust that it's going to continue to be worth investing a community's time in, and the trust that if something goes horribly wrong, there's a path to, to exit. Those are the key things and how they are discharged. Is a, is a, is, Just a quick about. note that, you know, revisions to these principles through the POSI effort um, have are underway. And I, a lot of these revisions are brought forward by those organizations who are struggling and thinking through how to interpret um, what are in the principles. To underscore Cameron's point, um, I think we would expect and hope that they would continue to evolve so that it better meets the diversity of organizations by which you know this, this might apply, right? There was no way that we would be able to come out with the ones that would end up sticking around. And so I'm super glad that there are revisions and I, but to kind of uh, underscore my, my prior point, if POSI evolves to have more structure such that, you know, not as a separate governance entity or legal entity organization, God knows we do not need any more of those, but where there are, there's more structure around, you know, we, uh, revisions work in this way, right? Um, and we make suggestions for how to interpret certain principles, blah, blah, blah. These are some things, um, some of the things that I think will really advance the propagation as well as adoption of the, these principles. And that actually leads really well to what I wanted to ask, because um, I was curious about that revision process. And one thing I'm curious about, as you've gotten all these self audits from the people that have signed on and seeing which ones people have and have not been following as well, you know, which ones are being rated red, how does that influence how much you uh, revise the principles? If you see uh, there's consistent things that people are often not doing, does that mean that that might be a principle to change or does that mean something else needs to change in society to help people meet that principle? I'm just curious how you think about that sort of thing. So, I mean, my take and, um... Dan, you might, uh, I don't know whether you'll agree with this, but I don't, I think the, I think the group that runs the Posey principal site sort of accepts these as, as they are. They're not like reviewing them or revising them. Um, they have meetings occasionally to discuss them and, you know, and to exchange um, observations about like what was hard to do, what was hard to explain, what was, you know, um, and that, that was what drove the revisions. Um, um, but but I, I think, and I think correctly, they're they're just they're taking these at face value. Like you put it up there, it's your community that's supposed to 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 hold you to account, right? We're not they're they're not um, peer reviewing these things or doing anything like that, right? They're just they're saying, okay, we'll put that up. Great, thanks. You know, we'll answer questions, so on. Is that? And and I think just to be you know, really underscore this, we the three of us have really intentionally stepped back. From those processes there was a revision a 1.1 version that clarified a few things and i think in a good way yep. i didn't entirely agree with it but i think the clarifications made sense yep. and they are important to the to the signatories um and that's they they're taking ownership of the the development of that for the future um we are not the originalists on the supreme court um <laughs> I mean, we have opinions you might have guessed that but um but yeah i think it's important that it be a community property going forward and that's that's the key um yeah thank you for that kia everyone adam from coco um yeah uh, we build scholarly infrastructure and um a couple of things i think you're right on jeff with the research integrity issue i mm -hmm. think um it's been used as a as a um, proxy metric for proprietary services and uh, i think that we really have to figure out a way to counter this because i think it's a way of large publisher to te technology providers of keeping people in the in their domain and I, I think it's it's really going to be hugely problematic um so that's one issue but the other thing that i was just wanted to know about i mean i'm going to be the really boring guy in the room who says and what about ai <laughs> so the problem is is that ai is an important part of scholarly infrastructure and will become i believe more important and there are problems within the uh, perception of it within the scholarly sector and the use of it. There's big questions. And also there's a problem with the technology itself because it's in part technology and in part content, which yep. also brings up problems. 
the open source institute itself doesn't quite know how to deal with this what is an open source llm for example yep. do you feel that posi has to take a position on this or do you feel that you have to outline principles that cater for it or you follow the lead of for example the osi and just take their definition um so i did have some slides in here where i was talking about um ai in particular and some of the things that have happened there. I mean, to me, the most disturbing is that I must have spent like six or seven years talking to researchers in the community about how important it was that we enable, you know, that open access was a route to allow people to text and data mine stuff so that we could do machine learning on it and so on and so forth. And then it's like, oh my God, the wrong people did it. You know, we're not happy. Um, you know, we didn't expect it to be the big rich corporations that were going to do it. I'm like, well, geez, I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, um, so I'm a little disturbed at the backlash against open that has occurred there. Um, I feel like, you know, I understand it. It's like, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I think, I think the people who are running these organizations are kind of creepy and dangerous. Um, but at the same time, I think that, you know, reversing our, our, um, our, our, you know, principles <laughs> on, on whether or not something should be open is not is not going to be a helpful way to deal with this. Um, but one of the things we unearthed in that Google Drive directory, yeah, great open infrastructure there, by the way, um, was um, a paper we wrote, which we can did a huge amount of work on, and condensed down to one page, um, and which was concerned about the flow through issues. So at the time, this is going to age us. We were talking about the risks involved in NIH Data Commons using AWS as the back end for open infrastructures. And we tried to work through it, and it's hard, but we did try and say, yeah, where are the guarantees need to sit um, so that there's safety um, for the community? I think the same principles could be applied here. It's probably harder and more difficult to unpick. Another example of early integration. But I think there are pathways, again, thinking through what's the intent? What's the, what's the thing we're trying to protect here? Um, and here it's the ability of a community to take the system and go and host it somewhere else or do, do something else. And maybe that means we don't use some stuff. Um, and again, you know, maybe that means we don't have the, the, the shiniest stuff, um, uh, which is going to be a hard sell because um, researchers always like the shiny. <laughs> um, as someone who spends their actual working day building LLMs, I guess I will reiterate that Large language models are just in the latest technology. Does it offer up new horizons for what is possible with technology? Absolutely. But if we're coming back to the question of trust, you know, and Gen AI, um, that is certainly an entirely open question. Uh, but to the extent that there are some precepts that we already know very well from the experience that Jeff has mentioned decades of certain, you know, changes happening to um, the, you know, tools that scientists use, formerly open, you know, those are things that we can still rely on and, and continue to build off of. But yeah, the trust with AI. I mean, I think there's, there's that, that's, an, that's a broader, larger conversation. Hello, as the opening inverted comma, speaking to the uh, closing inverted comma of today, I just wanted to, make the connections between the kind of themes of the conversations that we had this morning, Leslie and I, and what was coming through this afternoon and questions about language around, around trust and about appropriation of language um, is quite interesting. That's actually run as a theme through, through it. Um, the other kind of point I, I just wanted to briefly make is that you, you made the comment, Jeff, about if it doesn't say open, it, like, don't believe it, you know, they're, they're just lying. But sometimes they do say open and they're still lying. So we've got to be thinking about, Absolutely. okay, so open research, uh, open search infrastructure or open infrastructure. There's yeah. a big difference between those two things. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, that, sorry. Um, that's a, a really important distinction. I, I, I completely agree with you. And I had, I had a slide. In there that said sometimes open doesn't mean open right i mean let's just look at open ai right i mean it's just like the classic example um but um and then as you say open science you know or infrastructure what is it modifying right um and um and we really do again we just have to be um so many of this of these terms and phrases 
um, have a, a kind of a lulling effect on us, right? You know, we, sit, we hear it, we're like, oh, nonprofit, it's got to be all right. You know, oh, researcher led, what, what could possibly go wrong? Um, and um, yeah, we just have to be a little more critical, I think. But, I mean, I think here we come back to, yes, open is a very specific term, but open itself as a word, thank you, Danny, it, it's, it, what does yeah. it mean? But hence the principles, right? Yeah. If the principles are meant to provide evidence of open right. so that we no longer have to use, rely on a single word as the proxy. And the bottom line is exit. Like, can you fork it? Can you leave? If you can't do that, it's not open, right? I just wanted to thank the panelists for being up here. And I think we can draw this to the close. So thank you very much.